Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. So I'll be taking you through approach to post-operative fever. So coming to the definition. So if the core temperature is more than 38 degrees on two consecutive days or 39, more than 39 degrees on one day or one occasion, then it is called as post-operative fever. Usually it is uh, defined by the core temperature, which is ideally the rectal temperature or the nasal temperature, which we use in ICUs, which are nasal probes. Otherwise, commonly we take axillary or the oral temperature. So that can be considered 0 0.5 degrees less than the core, temp core temperature. Now, how does it occur? The fever pathophysiology, as we all know, it is a manifestation of cytokine release and response to all the inflammatory factors. And the inflammatory factors which are commonly enumerated to cause fever are IL-1, IL-6, the TNF-alpha and interferon gamma. I'm not going to the details of all these. They actually act on the hypothalamic endothelium and raise the set point of hypothalamic thermostat. And this uh, uh, allows the body to produce heat and conserve heat, which manifests as fever. So we are more, uh, more concerned about what are the causes of this uh, cytokine release, whether it is infectious or non-infectious. So just to remember, there are a uh, few, uh, there is a synonym for post-operative fever that is six Ws. So the Ws include wind, water, wound, walk, wonder drug, and the wonky glands. So I'll be taking you uh, through all these six Ws in, uh, in short. And the first one is wind, that is atelectasis, which usually occurs within 24 to 48 hours of a surgery, which was uh, done under general anesthesia. It might occur under regional anesthesia as well, but it is more common in surgeries which occur under general anesthesia. The pathophysiology remains that there is uh, the patient remains in recumbent position. So the timing of surgery is important. So if the surgery is prolonged, then the chances of atelectasis is high. And the post-operative sedation as well as pain, which doesn't allow the patient to move his thorax comfortably or uh, use his breathing capacity to the maximum, that causes atelectasis. The clinical features include tachypnea, cough, dyspnea. There may be crackles on uh, auscultation. The patient may have some amount of hypoxemia and there may, may be basal infiltrates on the chest x-ray if done. The management includes early mobilization, incentive spirometry, adequate pain relief, and bronchodilators. Now, there are other causes of fever because of uh, 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 causes which affect the lungs, and one of the most common is pneumonia. The pneumonia can be community acquired, so the patient might have had contacted the uh, bacteria prior to admission or prior to surgery, which was not detected in the preoperative period and may manifest later, say within 48 to 72 hours of surgery, if it is manifesting, then it is it can be termed as community acquired chest infection, or it, it may be VAP if the patient was in prolonged ventilation for more than 48 hours for, uh, post surgery, it can be ventilator associated pneumonia also. Or if the patient was in altered sensorium, or there was pressure ventilation was used in the post-operative period, or there was history of vomiting in a uh, state of, say, partial uh, consciousness, or the patient was not in full GCS, then there can be aspiration pneumonitis also. And if the patient had DVT or uh, manifests with hypoxia and tachycardia, it can be pulmonary embolism as well. So these are the various causes of fever in the post-operative period, the most common being atelectasis. So these are the chest x-ray. You can see there is basal atelectasis in uh, more on the left side in this uh, chest x-ray. In the second x-ray, you can always see there is a consolidation patch, which is more suggestive of pneumonia. In the third x-ray, you can see diffuse infiltrates all over the body, all over the uh, chest in bilateral uh, lung fields. And this happened when the patient aspirated after a bout of vomiting. This was in a patient recently who developed aspiration pneumonitis in our uh, ICU on post-operative day five. Then the third, second W is water, that is urinary tract infection, which usually manifests within 48 to 72 hours. The risk factors include old age, females. The, if there is length of cat catheterization is important, 
or even if the patient was catheterized and the catheter was removed on POD1 or say on the same day, then also it forms a risk for UTI in the post-operative period. The other risk factors include uh, uncontrolled diabetes and history of previous UTIs. So the symptoms include fever, increased frequency, urgency, or suprapubic pain. Other patient may complain of the burning micturition if the catheter has been removed. If it has not been removed, there may be pain in the periurethral area. The majority of the patients remain asymptomatic. Once the catheter is removed, the uh, symptoms subside. But if the culture turns out to be positive and there is symptomatic pyuria, it needs antibiotic cover based on the culture sensitivity or the local uh, uh, culture sensitivity pattern. The most common organisms include E. coli and Enterococcus. At times, it may be Candida species as well. Empirical treatment is directed by local resistance pattern and the patient's condition and comorbidities till the culture sensitivity arrives. So as I said, majority get relieved on their own, but if the patient is symptomatic or is in sepsis, then it needs treatment and attention. The third W is wound, that is superficial or deep surgical site infection. The infections that occur at or near surgical site within 30 days of surgery or within 90 days if there has been implants, especially in orthopedic surgery, it is termed as a surgical site infection. It usually manifests on POD 5 to 10. However, it may manifest in the early period like within 1 to 3 days in uh, infection with Clostridia or group A streptococci. So, these patients are usually infected prior to the surgery and they manifest in the post-operative period when the patient is immunosuppressed. Now, the types of wound infection can be superficial, as I said. It involves the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. As you can see in the first photograph, it is a small photograph, but you can appreciate that there is some very uh, incisional erythema and there may be some serious discharge. However, there is no tenderness and no major purulent discharge from the wound. The second uh, photograph shows a deep SSI in which the fascia and the muscle are involved. And the third photograph shows the organ space SSI where you can see blisters over the skin suggestive of necrotizing fasciitis and probably it is a deep seated infection in the uh, organ space maybe because of anastomotic leak or abscess in the abdominal cavity. The risk factors for SSI include again old age, poor nutrition and obesity which are obvious uncontrolled diabetes, smoking which affects the wound healing, and impaired immune status in the form of, say, the patient is HIV positive or on immunosuppressants or on corticosteroids, and there are other concomitant infections. In these cases, the SSI rate is high. Now, what should we do when we encounter a superficial uh, surgical site infection? So, routine culture swabs should be avoided uh, because it is usually contaminated with the skin flora. However, if there is a purulent drainage and the patient is running fever, continuous or recurrent, then it needs to be evaluated. In that case, we do send for culture sensitivity. Otherwise, the, it is not routinely sent. The patients with sepsis should be, should be suspected to be a case of deep SSI or organ space SSI, and they need imaging as well in the form of ultrasound or CECT to evaluate the internal organs. The most common pathogens causing SSI include, varies with the side of surgery and hospital stay. So if it is a, uh, say a thyroid surgery or a breast surgery or a peripheral limb surgery, then the chances of gram positive bacteria affecting the wound is more that is streptococcus or staphylococcus. But if it is a chest surgery or abdominal surgery, then the chances of gram negative bacteria and enterococci is, is higher. So in, in, the, in patients who are uh, septic or who are symptomatic, they do need antibiotics according to, uh, to, should be started according to the site of surgery, followed by the uh, culture sensitivity report, which should guide us for the further uh, management. Coming to the fourth W, that is walking, that is DVT and pulmonary embolism. So any surgery is a prothrombotic, prothrombotic state and post-op DVT, in, it, it, it encounters for the, it accounts for 20% of all hospital acquired DVTs. And it usually occurs in the later half of the um, surgical uh, period that is usually beyond POD 4 and 5. And it may occur up till if the patient is, remains hospitalized, the uh, risk of DVT uh, remains till the patient is discharged. The high risk cases are abdominal and pelvic surgery, 
lower extremity orthopedic surgery because patients remain immobilized for a long time major trauma or spinal cord injury again because the patient remains uh, immobilized for a long time and malignancy and obesity which are pro thrombotic states patients can present with pe without signs of dvt so the patients may not have a leg swelling may not have a tenderness in the calf but still may have pulmonary embolism and this is because there may be thrombus in the uh, proximal veins and may not manifest as a overt uh, deep vein thrombosis so if the if a dvt is suspected then color doppler should be done immediately and therapeutic anticoagulation should be started if uh, there is no contraindication to it now coming to the wonder about drugs so there are multiple drugs which can cause fever and it is the most most common non infectious cause of fever in the post operative patient and can occur on any post operative day that is most important so one of the most important thing which can cause fever in the post operative period is the transfusion of blood products the other uh, medications which can cause fever you can name you name any medication and that can cause fever be it heparin be it antimicrobial say vancomycin or beta lactam which include every and a uh, common antibiotic which we use anti convulsants like phenytoin so how do they cause fever it uh, it can be because of the inf infusion site inflammation especially when we give uh, potassium or ppi through the uh, peripheral veins then it it is more uh, commonly it causes the uh, venous uh, thrombophlebitis then uh, there are drugs which can stimulate heat production like thyroxin there can there are drugs which limit the heat dissipation that is atropine and epinephrine and there are drugs which can alter the thermoregulation like antihistaminics and antipathinogen parkin parkinson drugs so i told you uh, there any drug you name it and it can cause fever in the post operative period so an another w which is uncommonly discussed that is the wonky gland wonky means which is not straight so there are two glands in our body which are not straight they have erratic functions so adrenal insufficiency and thyrotoxicosis so these are the two uh, situations in which the patient may develop fever along with other manifestations so adrenal insufficiency can present with fever with hypotension hyponatremia hyperkalemia and hypoglycemia and it is usually in patients who undergo adrenal surgery or already have a adrenal suppression so management includes maintenance of euglycemia hydrocortisone hydrocortisone infusion and fluid resuscitation obviously thyrotoxicosis can occur in all patients who are suffering from some thyroiditis or have evidence of uh, hyperthyroidism it can present with tachycardia hypertension hyperthermia the management includes again propranolol propylthiazepine and iodine so it doesn't occur in every patient but yes in endocrine ward you should be very cautious about these two factors so how to approach a case of post operative fever so first of all evaluate the patient that is abc which is very important because the fever can be killing also so once you go to the patient you always uh, examine for the airway breathing and circulation you may not be the person who has seen the patient the, uh, in during the surgery you may be the first person in icu to attend the person who doesn't know about the history prior so first first of all you should go and assess the airway breathing and circulation once you are uh, happy with the airway breathing and circulation you go for the evaluation of the cause of fever so first step is history it is always there so history is the most important you should know about the pre operative status of the patient that can be taken care of by the uh, notes which are present with the patient or you can may even ask the, uh, uh, the treating doctor so pre op status should be known the comorbidity should be assessed whether there was controlled uncontrolled diabetes any thyroid ailment any adrenal ailment so these things should be assessed then the extent and nature of the surgery is very important the nature of anesthesia is very important and grade and frequency of the fever that is also to be assessed now second comes the evaluation of nursing chart in detail so course of stay in the hospital say the patient presented with fever on fifth day so you should uh, always see the nursing chart whether the patient was had a drain in place or not when it was taken out whether the patient had tachycardia or tachypnea any time prior to that episode of fever 
so everything should be uh, taken care of whether there was blood transfusion or any medications which the nurses have given or administered to the patient then comes the symptoms so along the fever if there is rash cough dyspnea chest pain so rash may be present may be a sign of allergy may be due to medications due to transfusion cough and dyspnea and chest pain are more suggestive of there is some chest ailment may be uh, atelectasis may be uh, pneumonia may be a pulmonary embolism then dysuria may be because of uti the patient is running fever leg swelling to rule out dvt iv site thrombophlebitis abdominal pain or discharge from the wound should always be assessed if you are suspecting ssi so these things should be uh, should be looked for then comes the signs which you should look for again uh, we have to confirm the symptoms by evaluating the surgical site in detail doing the chest examination in detail and abdominal examination to rule out polycystitis or any abdominal collection or something like uh, with fever or some uh, something like deep organ deep uh, deep ssi and apart from that you have to evaluate the iv sites also and you have to evaluate the foley's tube also so all these constitute the assessment of the patient who presents with fever in the post operative period how do you evaluate so evaluation should always be guided by your assessment initial assessment so you send for a hemogram you send for cultures depending upon what is the uh, matter of concern so if you know that the patient is on foley's for a long period and is running fever then it is more important to send a urine culture rather than sputum tracheal aspirate or pus you know and if the patient has a uh, purulent discharge from the wound then it is more important that you send for the pus culture rather than the urine and sputum uh, concentrating on the urine and sputum and but blood culture is very important blood culture should be sent i think in all cases of fever if the patient is septic stat gram staining is important if you are suspecting necrotizing fasciitis because it is a infection which needs to be treated as soon as possible then comes the imaging so imaging can be uh, chest x rays which can be important in patients with pneumonia or regular follow up in patients with uh, post operative fever Co contrast and ct scan that is important to evaluate for anastomotic leaks and to evaluate for abscesses in the intra abdominal or intra thoracic cavity and pulmonary embolism if we suspect a pulmonary embolism then ct angio of the chest is important to look for the thrombus in pulmonary vessels then color doppler if we are suspecting a dvt ultrasound if we are suspecting a cholecystitis or intra abdominal collection then c diff toxin assay can be sent in few patients if they are presenting with diarrhea with fever and we do not find any other cause substantial cause of fever in those patients so all the evaluation should be guided by the initial uh, examination and initial symptom symptomology so the as i already stated the most common causes of fever in pod 1 and 2 will be atelectasis atelectasis and apart from that there can be persistent infection in a patient operated in emergency or uh, other causes which are uh, not that common but it should be thought of one of them is transfusion reaction then thyroid crisis malignant hyperthermia they are these are rare causes and any drug causing fever in perioperative period if the fever occurs in perioperative period these things should be take should be all should always be thought of on pod 3 and 5 it is uh, it is the infection which sets in and it is usually related to the indwelling devices say cystitis or uti because of the catheter sinusitis may occur because of the indwelling rile tube in the uh, patient's nasal cavity so it may imbibe uh, bacteria and cause sinusitis thrombophlebitis may occur if there is a peripheral vein in use for more than 48 hours or there is some spillage in the local area then hematoma in the uh, wound or hematoma in the abdominal cavity or thoracic cavity that can uh, develop infection and cause fever and from pod 3 to 5 tissue necrosis and chest infection that may present in uh, within 3 to 5 days of uh, any surgery now from pod 5 to 8 that is uh, around a week of surgery the most important cause of fever in uh, gi patients is uh, anastomotic leak apart from that uh, wound infection or intra abdominal abscess or intra thoracic abscess these can cause fever from pod 5 to 
the rare causes can be antibiotic induced diarrhea and dvt and pulmonary embolism can occur in in any patient with a major surgery from pod4 and onwards so what is important is uh, can we prevent the the fever uh, in the post operative period yes prevention is possible and it is always better than the cure so the preventive measures which should, which we should take is early ambulation use of anticoagulants in case of major surgery wherever it is indicated active chest physiotherapy to begin to, and it should begin pre operatively so the patient is tuned to do it in the post operative period when he or she has pain then also he is uh, he knows how to do chest physiotherapy and he will do it there should be adequate pain control we should use epidural blocks we should use regional blocks to avoid pain in the post operative period to comfort the patient and allow them to do chest exercises as much as possible we should avoid catheters as much as possible we should practice early removal of drains and we should in, uh, go for early oral intake so that there is less translocation of bacteria to the gut and we should avoid unnecessary transfusions so these all can prevent fever in the post operative period so what is the take home message that early fever is usually non infectious majority resolves spontaneously the early causes of fever within 1 to 3 days exceptions include fever following emergency surgery or soft tissue infection which may uh, require intervention the fever occurring on or after 5 days is usually infectious and should be taken care of deadly causes of post operative fever include necrotizing infection clostridium infection transfusion reactions which which can prove fatal in no time so we should be very careful about that pulmonary embolism can cause mild fever and more of pulmonary symptoms and asthmatic leak if not taken care of can cause sepsis and death so these things should be uh, should know should be known to the uh, person who is taking care of the post op in the post operative period and should uh, take adequate measures in time rare causes of fever include sinusitis meningitis periorectal abscess acute cholecystitis parotitis while uh, these should always be kept in mind while if the patient is for weeks in the hospital then endocarditis and prostatic infection can also cause fever uh, if i have time i can go for few case scenarios uh, so somebody will uh, would have to help me out with case scenarios because i'll be asking questions so i cannot hear the uh, to the people sitting behind So if there is a mic here, so uh, I think people can answer. Yeah, sure. Okay, that's fine. A uh, 58 year say case scenario one. A 58 year woman underwent mastectomy under general anesthesia. In the evening, she developed fever that was 38.7 degrees Celsius. She complains of stitch line pain, controlled on medications. There is mild serous discharge from the wound. This she is not on any antibiotic. She only received a pre-operative prophylactic antibiotic. and hemodynamically stable no catheter or central line is there wbc count which was sent in the post operative period was 9500 uh, per microliter so what do you do next so these are the options so do you send for urine culture do you do a blood culture do you do a bone swab and chest x ray or you do you go for observation only so people are saying observation only so that's fine because uh, this is a post operative day 0 or day 1 this is one episode of fever that doesn't uh, stand for a post operative fever as well it is just one episode of 38.7 degree celsius and the patient is well controlled on pain she is doing well she is immunologically stable no signs of sepsis and no signs of sirs and so might be atelectasis might be drug induced so we should observe if the patient repeats on fever then we should go ahead so that's fine so second case is a 65 year obese diabetic male underwent open colostomy for gangrenous cholecystitis in the evening of surgery the temperature was 40 degrees celsius tachycardia was there abdominal pain was there and the saturation was 94% of room air altered mental status was there there was local tenderness skin blisters were present and crepitus was present there was dirty fluid coming out of the drain and microscopy shows gram positive rods so what do you think is the diagnosis in this patient uh, 
first answer is uh, b sir second answer is uh, d and uh, final answer is uh, step uh, a sir so uh, you didn't listen to a question uh, correctly i told you it is altered mental status local tenderness skin blisters crepitus present and there was dirty fluid coming from the drain fasciitis and clostridium perfringens sir yeah correct so it is likely a necrotizing fasciitis the patient has been operated for gangrenous cholecystitis you see and there was gram negative if uh, if i am correct there was gram positive rods which is seen on microscopy so if it is gram positive rods it has to be clostridium perfringens so what is the appropriate management C, yes, it is C because if it is necrotizing fasciitis, you have to do a surgical debridement immediately along with addition of uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, including broad spectrum penicillin and anaerobic cover, obviously. So, their necrotizing fasciitis is of two types type 1 that is polymicrobial with aerobes and anaerobes usually occurs after surgery in patients who have uh, uncontrolled diabetes, obese, or pre uh, operative. the predisposition in the form of gangrenous cholecystitis and type 2 that is monomicrobial which is usually caused by group a streptococci and streptococcus pyogenes so though mrs is becoming more common for type 2 but this uh, particular patient was probably a type 1 uh, necrotizing fasciitis so in all these patients you have to go for abc intubate the patient iv access resuscitation early broad spectrum penicillin uh, g and anaerobic cover should be given and surgical debridement is a must because antibiotics alone mortality is 100 patient percent in necrotizing fasciitis the case scenario 3 that this is the last case scenario 61 years female undergoes a total hip replacement has foliage in c2 develops fever on pod1 resolves spontaneously foliage removed on pod1 she has been ambulating doing spirometry vitals are stable her wound is healthy The saturation is ninety nine percent on room air. She develops fever on POD four. So, what is the likely cause of fever on POD four? Is it deep vein thrombosis, UTI, prosthesis infection, or superficial surgical site infection? UTI. Yeah, likely UTI because I told you as if the patient has a uh, history of catheterization, then it causes fe for fever if it develops without any other symptoms of wound infection or some or um, difficulty in uh, breathing. Then likely the cause is UTI. So it cannot be SSI, cannot be deep vein throm. Uh, it is not deep vein thrombosis because she doesn't have any uh, signs of D D V T. and it is likely uti which is likely to resolve on its own or we can start with a local uh, antibiotic based on the local culture and then uh, follow up with the culture sensitivity report so uh, what is the take home message after all these uh, case scenarios we should be well versed with all the common causes of fever and the timing study the 6 w's we talked about we should always try to figure out the possible triggers which causes fever and we should know what can prove fatal example the pulmonary embolism the necrotizing fasciitis and transfusion reactions and we should always have a working diagnosis before we embark on the investigations so that's all uh, from my side